Welcome to Online Worship. I'm Charles Maynard, one of the pastors at Cokesbury in Knoxville. We're glad that you're a part of our online worship community. Today we have wonderful music, a time of prayer and listening to the word. We've been considering setting the tone, being the thermostat in the room instead of the thermometer. And we round out this series with love, the thing that binds them all together. I hope that you will be able to worship and enjoy this. Our scripture lesson from today comes from John 14, 1 through 7. At the last meal Jesus would eat with his disciples before he was arrested and everything changed, he said to them, I give you a new commandment. Love each other. Just as I have loved you, so you must also love each other. This is how everyone will know that you are my disciples when you love each other. Then a little later he said, don't be troubled, trust in God, trust also in me. My father's house has room to spare. If that weren't the case, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? When I go to prepare a place for you, I will return and take you to be with me so that where I am, you will be too. You know the way to the place I am going. Thomas asked, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you have really known me, you will know the Father. From now on, you know him and have seen him. This is the word of God for the people of God, and we say, thanks be to God.
I'm glad that you're all here today, that we can be for this last Sunday of considering this little snippet of a letter that Paul wrote to the church at Colossae. He wrote to them, as therefore God's picked representatives of the new humanity, purified and beloved of God himself, be merciful in action, kindly in heart, humble in mind, accept life and be most patient and tolerant with one another, always ready to forgive if you have a difference with anyone. Forgive as freely as the Lord has forgiven you. And above all else, be truly loving. For love is the golden chain of all the virtues. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, remembering that as members of the same body, we are called to live in harmony. And never forget to be thankful for what God has done for you. So, these last weeks, we've talked about compassion and kindness, and humility, and goodness, and patience. We've talked about all of these, and now we turn our attention to love. I mean, after all, love is what holds it all together, right? It, in these past weeks, we've talked about compassion, kindness, humility, goodness, and patience, which are simply ways to love, instruments in being loving. Love is, as said in that translation, the golden chain that strings all those attributes together, the, the perfect bond, the super glue, if you will. The thing that holds all of that together is love. Now we say, ah, love. Charles, you really worked it out great to have the love one come the week that Valentine's occurred, right? And I must tell you that there was probably years of planning that went into that, or it just could have been that that's the way it worked out. But love, we like to talk about love. And this week with Valentine's, a great time to do that. I mean, it was 50 years ago this week that I gave a Valentine to a girl in high school that uh, she, I was the Charlie Brown to the redheaded girl. She was uh, uh, the most intelligent person in the room, valedictorian of our class, I will point out. And uh, she was sharp, she was fun, she was funny, and someone I enjoyed. So I gave the first Valentine to Janice Scott, sitting back there on the right. But some years before, in the fourth grade, I had to do Valentine's for my class. We made a, took a shoebox and decorated it and were told to bring Valentine's to people in the class. My mother said, go up and do the Valentine's right now. That's just a part of your homework tonight. Get that done. So five minutes later, I was back downstairs and she said, you, you finished them? Yes, ma'am. She said, let me see them. So I handed her the five Valentines that I had done. She said, wait, wait, where, are the, where are the rest of them? I said, I don't have to do any more. She said, what do you mean? I said, these are the only people I like in my class. <laughs> she said, what about, what about uh, uh, Billy? I said, oh gosh, I don't like him at all. He's terrible. Uh, well, what about, she started asking names. And then she said, and there are no girls in here. I said, you're not gonna give a Valentine to a girl? was stupid in the fourth grade. She said, you have to give a Valentine to everybody. I said, no, really, I'm not interested. I'm, I'm not interested in that. She said, well, that's the deal. Everybody in the class gets them. I said, well, okay, but I'm not giving any to any girls. Why? I'm not going to give any to any girls. She said, well, I'm a girl. Are you not going to give me a Valentine? Well, no. And she said, and Allison and Martha, your sisters, surely you're going to give them a Valentine. Well, and what about grandmother? And what it, she went down the list of my aunts that lived around us, and it's like, okay, okay, I get it, I get it. She said, Valentines are for everybody, whether you like them or not. Well, I did it. I didn't agree with it, but I did it. 
But you know, that love that we celebrate on Valentine's Day is, is nice and sweet. It can even be romantic. But that's not the love that Paul wrote about. That's not the love that Jesus constantly talked about. Jesus was always talking about love, love of God, love of neighbor, love of enemy. A radical love that knew no bounds. I mean, think about it. Jesus was often criticized by the good religious people for the people he hung around with. They said, you'll just go talk and sit with anybody. Prostitutes, traitors, criminals, thieves, tax collectors, lepers, sick, infirm. Sick and infirm were considered unclean in Jesus' day. They were on that same list with everybody else. But Jesus knew no boundaries. Jesus would not exclude anyone. The passage that Rebecca read, that moment at the Last Supper when he said, love one another as I have loved you. Love as I love, Jesus said. And then he went on to say, in my Father's house are many rooms. Or as the translation she read today, there's room to spare. There's plenty of room. But that's not the world we live in. We live in a world of boundaries. We make distinctions everywhere. We build barriers to keep ourselves safe. We divide people by liberal and conservative, Republican and Democrat, red states and blue states, old and young. We go along the idea that if you speak a different language, that's a different group. We even go by where you grew up, whether it's in another country, European, you're Asian, you're African, you're American. You're American. I want you to even think about this. You're American. Marcelo, where are you? He went to sleep. Ah. Marcelo and I were both born in America. Right? He happened to be born in South America, and I happened to be born in North America, but we were both born in America. But you see, even that, we say, well, there's... North America and South America and Central America. You see? And then you talk to Hispanic Americans. When I was superintendent and was working with churches all over the area, we had this wonderful Hispanic congregation led by Reverend Susana Lopez in Sevierville. And, and we, they were meeting in a little rundown building, and we finally found another place for them to meet. And so Susana said, we're going to have a parade, and we're going to walk from the old church to the new church. Will you come be with us? I said, yes, that'd be great. I said that before she picked the date of July the 30th when it was about 103 degrees. But anyway, she said, we're all going to carry the flag of the country where we were born. And so there I showed up with my American flag, the United States flag. And here were flags from El Salvador and Peru and Bolivia and Honduras and Mexico, among others. We were standing there ready to start this walk with all these colors flying around. And a little girl, dark eyes, long, beautiful, dark hair, came up to me and she looked up at me and she said, you know, I was born in the United States. And I said, yes. And she just kind of looked at me and I said, would you like to carry my flag? And she grinned and said, yes. And so this little girl carried the flag, which was about as big as she was, for the two-mile walk to the new church. You see, even in that group, there was a distinction of where people were born. I mean, in the United States even, we break it down farther, don't we? Are you from the north or the south? Are you from the West? I mean, when a Tennessee, when a Tennessean travels abroad and runs into another Tennessean, have you ever listened to the conversation? Oh, I'm from Tennessee too. Oh, really? Where? 
And the answer is three words. It can be one of three words, east, middle, or west. That's what a Tennessee is asking you when you bump into them. Then you get to talk about the town. But, are, oh, are you an east Tennessean or a middle Tennessean? We draw lines everywhere. We draw lines along race. We draw lines along economic. We draw gender lines. We draw age lines. We draw lines to separate us out everywhere. Even among Christians, we draw lines between the ways that we hear the Bible and how we live those out. One of my friends, John Waters, always loved to tell the story about his cousin, Tebow, who was the barber in Pigeon Forge and was a strong part of his Baptist church. And somehow they got to arguing in the Baptist church over a particular point of doctrine. And they couldn't agree, and it was going to split the whole church. And John said that Cousin Tebow was kind of one of the leaders. And somebody came up with an idea that thought it could bring everybody back together and went down to the barber shop to talk to Cousin Tebow and said, listen, what about this? And gave them the idea. And his cousin said, no, 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 fellas. I can't hold with that. He said, if I were going to do that, I'd just go down the street and join the Methodist church and go on to hell. <laughs> John always liked to tell that when I was in the room. But you see, even among Christians, we draw lines. I mean, no wonder folks who are not a part of the church are confused and can't see Jesus. Because we've spent so much time erecting barriers that they can no longer see over the barriers we've erected to be able to see this loving God. This God who does not draw the same lines, who has no lines, who has no boundaries. I mean, somebody basically said to Jesus, you just love anybody. And Jesus said, yeah. I mean, even in the United Methodist Church, we are arguing over who God loves and how God loves them and how we're supposed to love them. Jesus was challenged one day by a Bible scholar, a legal expert. You see, the Bible and the law were the same thing. And said, but what must I do to inherit life? And Jesus replied, well, what's written in the law? If you're the legal expert. How do you interpret it? And the fellow said, well... You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your being, with all your strength, and with all your mind. And then you must love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said, that's it. You, you've got it. Do this, and you'll be just fine. Was that the end of the conversation? No. What did the fellow say? So who is my neighbor? Do you understand what that question is? I got to be able to draw a line somewhere what he's asking is, who is not my neighbor? Who do I not have to fool with? And Jesus tells a story about a fellow that gets beat up and left by the side of the road to die. You know that story. Jesus said over and over again, look, just watch little children. Uh, he said to live in God's way, you have to live like a child. And I don't know if you've noticed it, but most little children don't see barriers. You see, Jesus said, pay attention to the way they live, the way they love. Nicodemus, afraid to be seen with Jesus, comes at night. And they have a wonderful conversation. But, but do you remember this part where Jesus said, God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that everyone who believes in him won't perish, but will have eternal life. But the conversation continued. Jesus said, God didn't send his son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved by him, might be made whole through him. 
For whoever believes in him isn't judged. Whoever doesn't believe in him is already judged because they don't believe in the name of God's only son. Who did God say? What did Jesus say? God so loved the world? The world? Now, which country, God? Which community, God? But the word's very clear. The world. God so loved the world. Yeah, but which hemisphere? See, we, you know, we're going to work it out. The thing is, the word sin means that we've missed the mark, and it is about separation. It starts in Genesis, the separation that occurs between Adam and Eve and God, and then uh, their sons get separated, one killing another. And then, you see, what we like to do is we like to talk about sin. And what we're told is that it's about righteousness. Now, that's not a great word in English anymore because we talk about self-righteous people. Righteousness means right relationships. It's the opposite of separation. It's the opposite of sin. Righteousness is relating to one another well. We would rather have sin be a list of things. It's more, much more comfortable if we have the list of bad things, you see? And so we don't see sin as a separation. We see them as just don't do these things. Then you'll be fine. That's not what that is. It doesn't change the relationship. You see, we just like to check the things off the list. Yep, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that but we still draw the lines. We still build walls. We still erect barriers. And then it's easier to objectify the people on the other side of the wall. It's easier to no longer see another for who they really are. You know who they really are. A person made in the image of God Almighty. In the image of God, I recently heard of a group that is preaching that all of us are not children of God. That, that only ones who do these certain things, only they are considered children. You have to follow those rules, they say, or you're not in the family. Jesus does not say that. He says there are no boundaries. There is plenty of room in God's house. Friends, God does not need us to protect heaven. God does not need us to be gatekeepers. Right? We are to be people who stand at the gate with it wide open, welcoming others. We're to be characterized by love. To Nicodemus, he said, God didn't send his son into the world to judge, but that the world would be made whole in him. Jesus, at the Last Supper, again, the passage that Rebecca read, he said, I'm going ahead. I'm going to prepare a place. There's plenty of room for everybody. And Thomas said, hey, I, I, we don't know how to get there. Could, could you go over that part again? And what is it Jesus says? I am the way, the truth, and the life. You know, no one comes to the Father except through me. No one comes to the Father unless they love like I love. It's not just about calling Jesus by name. It's to follow. It's to be on his way, the way. He says, if you've really known me, then you've seen God. And from now on, you'll know him and see God. So, what kind of love the Father has given to us in that we should be called God's children? 
And that's what we are. Made in the image of an all-loving God. But because the world doesn't recognize that, the world doesn't recognize us. I'm talking about going against the culture of our day. About this sense that we all have to somehow take a side and be somewhere else instead of standing with Jesus. Side enough. Side enough, friends. John wrote a letter to the church in his old age. He said, dear friends, now we are God's children, and it hasn't yet appeared what we will be. We know that when he appears, we will be like him, because we'll see him as he is. And all who have this hope in him purify themselves, even as he is pure. Every person who practices sin commits an act of rebellion, an act of separation. Sin is separation. You know that he appeared to take away sins and there's no sin in him. Every person who remains in relationship to him doesn't sin. Any person who sins and has not seen him or known him. Little children, make sure no one deceives you. The person who practices right relationships is in right relation with God in the same way that Jesus lives in that right relationship. He said, everyone who hates a brother or sister is a murderer. And you know that murderers don't have life residing in them. This is how we know love. Jesus laid down his life for everyone. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. But if someone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, but refuses help, how can the love of God dwell in that person? And then he ends the thought, little children, let's not love with words or speech, but with action and truth. This is how we will know that we belong to the truth and reassure our hearts of God's presence. What is it? Paul wrote, not just in the passage that we're considering, but in another place, he said, all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. No boundaries, no lines, no walls, no barriers. We've been looking at, for weeks at this passage in Colossians that Paul wrote. But I want you to listen to how he begins the passage, the words right before what we've been considering. Take off the old human nature with its practices and put on the new nature, which is renewed in knowledge by conforming to the image of the one who created it. In this image, there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ is all things and in all people. And then he goes into that passage. As therefore God's picked representatives of the new humanity, purified and beloved of God himself, be merciful in action, kindly in heart, humble in mind, accept life, and be most patient and tolerant with one another, always ready to forgive if you have a difference with anyone. Forgive as freely as the Lord has forgiven you. And above everything else, be truly loving, for love is the golden chain of all the virtues. But then he continues, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, remembering that as members of the same body, you're all called to live in harmony and never forget to be thankful for what God has done for you. The peace of Christ must control our hearts, a peace into which you are called in one body. And be thankful, people. The word of Christ must live in you richly. Teach and warn each other with all wisdom by singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, 
Sing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And then the passage that has been underlined in my Bible since I was a teenager. He said, whatever you do, whether in speech or action, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus and give thanks to God the Father through him. Love. How do we love? Well, how do we love? Let's start with compassion and kindness, humility, and goodness, and patience. For, so, for God so loved the world, no exceptions, the world. In my Father's house, there's plenty of room. This is how you, they will know you are mine, he said, in the last meal that he would ever eat with them. This is how they will know you are mine, following in the way. They will love others as I have loved you. We are to love. And friends, it is not an easy task. It ultimately put Jesus on the cross to love in that manner. But that's how we're called. That's who we're to be. We're to go that way. The way. The truth. The life. Now, the way we can do this is because we know we are loved. So I want you to stand and sing with me this great song, I Am Loved. Again, thank you for joining us online. I leave you with these words. Be in God's peace. Know that you are loved, which frees you to love in the same way. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen.